Thank you for being back with us, ladies and gentlemen. We gave ourselves a little break, and now we're coming to a section that hopefully will give all of you some ideas about what you can and you shouldn't be doing. As we do that, though, I'm going to turn it over to Katie in a minute. One other resource you might want to look at, the Florida State Bar has published a document called Guide to Effective Legal Communications. So it's something that talks about what how lawyers can communicate and the like electronically. Uh, again, I believe if you Google it, you'll find it. it was a, there are two editions. You want the, the later edition, I believe, is the 2015 edition. It's called the Guide to Effective Legal Communications. And with that, let's talk about practical guidance and what let's, people can do and not do. Let's talk about practical guidance. So um, how many people here are on social media, have an active social media presence? And when I say social media, I'm talking about Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Google Plus. Who uses Google Plus? Hardly anyone. But Twitter. Twitter, all of those things, right? Who in this group is among the lawyers who hate social media with the fire of a thousand burning suns? <laughs> but you're on it. All and you're the time. on it. I like that. Um, so there are two two separate but related issues that... Let me ask one more thing yeah. before you do that. How many yeah. of you have websites, firm websites? Are they interactive websites? Can people respond to you on the website, or is it just a way for you to put your name out there? Okay, never mind. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, two things to think about and talk about in the world of lawyers and social media. One is how we lawyers use social media either for ourselves personally or in our law practices. The other is how we lawyers can and should advise our clients about the client's use of social media. So there are lots of um, opinions now addressing both of these areas. Fewer cases, so I like to encourage people to please be the test case, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, so that we can get some more uh, disciplinary case law or maybe some malpractice case law in the world of social media. That would be very helpful for future CLEs. Um, so starting with how we should be advising our clients about their use of social media, there are a couple of really um, sort of dramatic, famous, becoming famous cases now in the world of a lawyer's advice to a client about social media. There's a case out of Virginia. It's a few years old now. A lawyer in Virginia was suspended for five years, um, which is actually longer than you can be suspended in Colorado. The longest suspension in Colorado is three years, or disbarment are the options. This lawyer suspended for five years, sanctioned jointly and severally with the client to the tune of more than $700,000 for spoliation, and the underlying facts were that the lawyer represented a client in a wrongful death suit. The client's husband, or the client was the husband, his wife had been killed in a car accident. Um, during the course of that litigation, a discovery request came in for certain Facebook postings that the client had made. The lawyer's first mistake, in my opinion, is I. I'm pretty sure no one had looked at the client's Facebook page until that discovery request came in. So in terms of advising clients about social media use, this I put in my book of things you should talk about at the very beginning, maybe the first meeting, certainly the beginning of the representation, right? This is one of the things you want to talk about. How, what kind of social media do you have? How do you use it? Let's look at it together. Let's talk and think about these things and how they might impact the case. Um, because when you don't do that, you end up like this lawyer from Virginia who looks at the client's social media page and sees that on Facebook, the client has posted several pictures of himself on a boat, drinking beers, surrounded by like women in bikinis, wearing a shirt that says, I heart hot moms. And I think, although I was not a lawyer who did personal injury or wrongful death kinds of cases, on the plaintiff side, I think that this lawyer rightfully thought, this is not the kind of evidence I would like to see presented to our jury in my wrongful death lawsuit. This does not look like a grieving husband. Um, 
So the lawyer said, clean up the Facebook page. And I think the second potential mistake, this is a, it's a little bit unclear, but I think the words we use when we talk about social media are very important, as they always are, but the phrase clean up means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. In the world of Facebook, there are distinctions between deleting a Facebook account and deactivating a Facebook account and making private a Facebook account, right? Like these all have different meanings and therefore a different effect potentially on the case and the argument about spoliation. The client, this client deleted the photos from Facebook. But of course, nothing online is ever deleted, really. So the other side not only found out about the deletion, but recovered the photos and presented their motion to the court about spoliation of evidence. And after some motions practice and litigation, the court sanctioned the lawyer, hit them with this huge fee award, and then the lawyer was grieved and then disciplined and suspended for five years. Um, so that's a sort of a scary case. And I think that it highlights a couple of things. One is, in the world of social media, we're just analogizing to a different set of facts using the same rules. So just like when I was a baby lawyer and um, the lawyers I worked for would say to the summer associates, be careful what you talk about in the elevators because we're not the only law firm in this building and you need to be careful. Or I was an associate in St. Louis. Be careful what you talk about at the Cardinals game because there's lots of people around here who might be listening in, right? So. I I, I don't know for sure, but I don't think lawyers give that elevator speech anymore. I think now what they say is, don't tweet about work. Um, because it's kind of the same rules, but a different sphere in which it occurs, right? So um, as to the spoliation issue, this lawyer in Virginia is just like Arthur Anderson. It's just like, let's shred those financials. You know, it's let, let's delete the photos is not dissimilar from let's, you know, burn our financial records for the last five years. Let's delete this data. It's, of course, always bad. We know that. You can't do that. So the question then becomes, what can you do? And that's where we're going to go back to the issue from the very, very beginning about competence and think about what kind of competence you need in the area of social media so that you can tell your client it's okay to make private your Facebook account but don't delete anything. It's okay to deactivate your Facebook account but don't delete it. Or maybe it's just you should stop posting on Facebook for the duration of this legal matter. Um, there are certainly pieces of advice in this realm that are okay and that you should probably give to be a competent lawyer and then things you certainly cannot say like delete these photos delete this account um so understanding those distinctions and differences is it is important it's a very big issue so i'm wondering um if you all have cases that you've worked on or that your firm has seen where this idea of facebook in particular or blog posts have become a discovery issue or an evidentiary issue? Oh, in, in any litigation, there's a substantial amount of litigation these days where you see attempts to put social media evidence in. Uh, there are ethics opinions that talk about what lawyers can and can't do to try to investigate what a represented or unrepresented person is doing. Mm -hmm. um, I can't give you any personal examples. One more ethics example, there was a lawyer suspended were given a public reprimand in Massachusetts because his client was getting rid of all this stuff. It's kind of hard to tell from the opinion, but it sounds like at first he did not know what the client was doing and there came a time when he did. And at that point, there were disciplinary proceedings involved because in fact he was allowing the client to get rid of information. Uh, there are a lot of nuances to discovery of social media. We can talk about later about what you can and can't do ethically to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. it, it's a fascinating area and it's, again, we're taking all these principles that have sat around for a long time. There have been no changes to the ethics rules 
as far as I know, dealing with what we're discussing. We're talk, we've talked about competence. We've talked about confidentiality. The rule that lawyers get tripped on is a 4.4. That's uh, misrepresentations, fairness to adversary counsel and to courts. So you can't misrepresent things in the context of litigation. There's a catch-all rule, I believe it's 8.3, that people get in trouble with. And that hasn't, been, that hasn't been amended in 2012 with the other technology amendments. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get in trouble if you don't stop and think about what's going on. And we can go through talk about more as we go forward. I don't know, Lino, if you have other examples. I, I don't want to get us off track, but we probably see Facebook come up more frequently in the context of doing research into jurors. Uh, in the process of picking a jury, can you contact someone at your office, or maybe even do it yourself in the courtroom, and look at the jurors' Facebook pages. Can you see what they've posted about themselves on social media? Um, obviously, you'd have to do that very quickly. But knowing that someone has a particular leaning, particular thoughts, particular ideology could make a huge difference in whether you want that person to serve on your jury. So I don't know if you'll be talking about that. Maybe we say that for our next yeah. CLE. <laughs> well, no, we can talk about it a little yeah. bit now. And there's a split in the country on that. Yes. The, the ABA says, well, here's the issue. If you go to a public page, because you can go to public pages of any person, basically, but if you go to a public page, sometimes, depending on the webs on the social media, there'll be a telltale. There'll be something that will let the person who holds the account know that you were looking at them. The ABA takes the position there's nothing wrong with it. In this, the New York guidelines, we said it's, it's an ethical violation because it's an ex parte contact, because they know you're looking at you. So it's interesting to see how that's going to go forward. And again, this goes back, if you're going to start doing these investigations, what's going to happen? A juror is not supposed, a prospective juror is not supposed to know you're looking at them. It's general, that's the easiest way to describe it. Uh, there are a lot of these things. There are a lot of issues going on. For example, can you access a social media page of somebody else? The case law generally speaks in that uh, unrepresented, you're an unrepresented person. Can I just friend you? And some courts say, yeah, sure. So some bo ethical bodies say, yeah, sure. Some say you can do it any way you want as long as you don't use some fraud to do it. And that she doesn't want to talk to me, but my paralegal was told to friend her. And don't tell why. Uh, I think it's New Hampshire. One jurisdiction says if you want to try to contact someone, not only you have to tell them you're a lawyer, but you have to tell them why you're contacting them. And so the ethics what, rules are all over the place. Yes. That's what yeah. Colorado would say, is if you want to access someone's social media account to, um, for purposes of your use in a case, then you can make the friend request. That's not prohibited, as long as you're not represented by counsel with regard to that matter. But you can make the friend request, but the friend request has to say, I'm Katie Rothgary, and I'm a lawyer working on XYZ case, and you might be a witness in that case, and I think you might have information on your Facebook page that would be relevant to that case, and so will you be my Facebook friend? <laughs> okay, and that's why I have no Facebook friends. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but what astonishes me is how few people have put up uh, Facebook security. Right. So I've, I've given this talk for many years, and there was one talk where, and I created a Facebook page just to stay in touch with my two daughters. And uh, this was a bit risky, but we were, we were live. We had an internet connection. I pulled up my Facebook page, and fortunately, all you could see was my picture and my name because I had moved up the uh, security settings to max. Very few people have done that. So you may not have to friend a prospective juror to get personal information about her. You just go on their page. They have photos. It's unbelievable what people have posted. And jurors aside, for purposes of discovery or your use in a case, the, the ethics opinions are unanimous, I believe, in saying that if it's public, it's fair game. So if there's no privacy setting and you can see the Facebook page, there's no prohibition you can use that. I think the more interesting questions about which, hint, hint, we need some case law, mm -hmm. are... Um, if you are, if, for example, a party in the case is already Facebook friends with someone who does have privacy settings, but because of their pre-existing friendship, they're within the privacy settings, so that person can access information, then can you use information you get from that 
third party in your case. You know, these are the, the more nuanced distinctions, I think. So obviously, if it's public, you can use it. If it's private, you can only use it if you get permission and sort of put yourself out there as in terms of who you are and why you want it. If you're representing a, a criminal defendant, um, the PDs, when I talked to them about social media, said, well, what if my client's in jail? Can I use my client's password to log in as the client to his own social media account and then see what's on there? Because it's just like if the client did it, the client's giving me permission to do it, and the client can't do it because the client's in jail. Um, is that okay? And there was one case in the early days of Facebook where the information on this young person's Facebook account was very relevant. And to ensure that the court had access to everything on the page, the court ordered uh, the plaintiff in the case to let, um, uh, to, to accept the friend request from the judge. Well, there's three ways to get discovery. We're talking about discovery now. Yeah. Not informal investigation. If I serve a request on you, for the, face, for the content of the, fe, of the Facebook page, there are rhymes and reasons you need to think about. First, you can't subpoena, you can't subpoena a provider. Right. It's barred by the Stored Communications Act. So the only way you get discovery of an adversary is to serve a request, and then there are three ways to respond to it. You can say, okay, you want the information, I don't care, I'll give you the password. So in other words, you're giving your adversary access to a, to a Facebook page or whatever. That's pretty rare. And presumably the person's represented by counsel. The counsel's going to say, don't ever do that. The other instance is, as you respond to any kind of discovery request, there's my client. I'm the attorney. I will go through it. I'll decide what's relevant, and I'll produce it. And the third option is what you mentioned. It's been done once, and a judge offered to do it in camera. I'm, I'm un I understand that never happened. On top of any other reason, I can't imagine why a judge would want to have to sit and do it in camera of things for a long time. But those are the options you have when you're doing formal discovery to get this stuff. But I know, and I think they did a segment on Planet Money or something, that under the terms of service with Facebook, you're not allowed to give anybody or something mm -hmm. about not sharing mm -hmm. your password. That's right. Yeah. Except, that, and we, I haven't seen it. Well, I've seen a number of cases with Facebook. I haven't seen anywhere that's come up. And I can't tell you I know specifically what the languages you're talking about, but I will bet you there's something in there that says you can reply to legal process. Because if not, I think the prosecutor, someone's going to be going to Facebook and saying there's a problem here. You're obstructing justice. I don't know the answer to that one, just like I don't know the answer to you. I'm going to think about your question. About, about if, yeah, if someone else is a friend and lets you use it. The only answer I have now is the, you cannot do, you cannot have a non-lawyer do for you what you can't do as a lawyer. And I have to think about how that works, but you right. can't access a social media account unless you say why you're doing it, yeah. generally speaking. So I can't imagine how a non, someone else who has access could do it with the idea they're giving you information without making the same disclosure. But it, there, look, we don't have many answers to a lot of these questions. We've got right. new technologies. Technologies change every day. I think the facts of that hypothetical depend a little bit too on how many Facebook friends someone has. So I frequently find myself saying, even if you have your privacy settings set to the maximum, mm -hmm. if you have two Facebook friends and they're your daughters, you probably have an expectation of privacy. If I have mine set to the maximum, but I have 500 Facebook friends, then I probably don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? Who, who, right? who aren't really friends. Right, so because in, they're, in they're not real really, they're not yeah, friends, they're not really then, friends right. I have dinner with, obviously, you know? So right. I think that matters, too, um, because arguably, if I'm posting something on social media, I know that all the people I'm friends with are going to see it. And that's part of the risk that we... I think have to talk to clients about with regard to their posting um, or their use of social media in the and the ways it could affect a case is because we all lose control once we post it. Like once we push send on the email, once we post something to the website, once we post something to Facebook, we lose control over it. People can forward it, 
Friends of friends might be able to see it. And the, the, those are the ways in which people find themselves in trouble then. Did you have a yeah, question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, a privacy settings, I get, but right. I think the question is whether you were using false pretenses. That one, I think, is problematic as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should do that. Like pretend you're someone you're not. I mean, it seems like there are other code policies for that. Mm -hmm. Well, the example. This is a Philadelphia bar opinion that came out a while ago, where there's a question: Can a lawyer, instead of using his or her own identity, have someone in the office friend someone without tell them they're a paralegal. And the answer was, well, that's a fraud. Yeah. You can't do that. Ethically, you can't do that. But there are a lot of things going on. There's so many things going on here. We'll leave competence aside, although everything we're talking about means you have to understand the platform you're going to or you want to investigate. So there's another set of issues in the world of social media with regard to the lawyer's use of social media. Our own blog posts, our own um, websites, our own Twitter accounts. So first, and importantly, there are lots of jurisdictions that have come out with eth ethics opinions, including most recently, I think, California and the District of Columbia, related to when the advertising and solicitation rules apply to a lawyer's website, blog, Facebook page, etc. They have a little bit, there's a little bit of a split in terms of what those opinions are holding. Um, in California, the rule or the ethics opinion says, if you, if your page is wholly personal, then the advertising and solicitation rules aren't going to apply to that page. Unless, you've impliedly made yourself available for legal work. So then it's more about the content of what you post. Do you have a Twitter account where you just post pictures of cats? Maybe, that's fair, no judgment. But that kind of Twitter account probably is never gonna be subject to the advertising and solicitation rules under the rules of professional conduct. But do you occasionally post pictures of cats and then you occasionally also comment about the newest Supreme Court case related to animal rights? for example. And sometimes you say, I love animal rights and I would like to do some work in that area, right? Then it's different. I mean, the, the content you post makes a difference in terms of whether you're subjecting yourself to the rules of professional conduct. Um, and so, and the DC opinion, I think, makes that a little bit more clear in a scarier way because what the DC opinion says is any posting, any blog, any website, might be subject to the rules of professional conduct. And there's an opinion from New York on LinkedIn. So how many people here have a LinkedIn page? This New York opinion... Uh, and, and I, well, there's a split on this one, too. There, yeah, there, 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 there is a split, but, but this one opinion says if you put anything on LinkedIn besides name, rank, and serial number, you have to put the attorney advertising disclaimer on. And I'll make but it better for you if you have a LinkedIn account. This one opinion says you have to periodically review what other people post about you to make sure it's accurate. So, so your endorsement. So, for example, if you have a friend who has no idea what you, what you practice and puts down, um, you're the world's best admiralty lawyer, you have a duty to check your LinkedIn page and then remove that um, endorsement. endorsement. Because, because you know it's inaccurate. I got endorsed once for oil and gas law on LinkedIn. Well, you might be I, a great oil and gas I, lawyer. Well, I might. I might still do that. That's a future endorsement, I think, because I haven't honed that skill yet, but I'm thinking maybe I will. But I took it off in the meantime because um, I never, you know, I never really practiced in that area. So I think you do have to be very mindful of what, not only what you're posting, but what other people are posting about you in terms of whether you're going to be subjected to the rules. There are also other ways in which the rules can come up. So there are finally two cases in Colorado um, from the last year or so in which lawyers were disciplined for their use of social media. And so both the cases, they're similar in that clients posted Google Plus reviews 
of these lawyer services. One also filed, I think, a Better Business Bureau complaint, and those are, are po posted on the Better Business Bureau website. And those, both of those forums provide an opportunity for the business owner, i.e. the lawyer, to respond. So both of these lawyers responded to these client reviews. The reviews were very negative, because all reviews are negative, because no one ever posts positive reviews right. in my experience. But um, So the reviews are very negative. The lawyers come in and respond. In both cases, the lawyers reveal not only confidential information, but damaging information, embarrassing information about the clients. To so defend in, themselves. To from defend the themselves, yeah. right. So the, the first yeah. lawyer says... Something like, I should have known that someone who never paid child support would also stiff me on my bill. Um, and he had represented the client in the family law case related to the child support. And then the other review, he says, this client paid me with a $5,000 check that was returned for insufficient funds. I, and she was charged with, you know, 16 felonies. And here's all the list of all the felonies. It wasn't really 16. I think it was like five. But um, here are the, here's the list of what she was charged with. Um, and so the, it's like very disparaging comments about the clients, details about what the client's legal matters were about, details about the payments made to the lawyers. Both of those lawyers were disciplined. The, the one lawyer who was actually um, had a... They, they both got significant discipline. One of them had a significant disciplinary history. So looking at this, just this instance of the 1.6 violations on social media is not an accurate, I think, picture of why he was suspended for six months with the requirement of reinstatement. The other lawyer was suspended for 18 months, but he had lots of other instances of disciplinary problems in that case. So I don't know that... On, on its own, that kind of 1.6 violation gets a big suspension like that. But certainly for these two lawyers, it did. I think what's interesting under 1.6 is the comments, the 1.6B and the comments 1.6 allow a lawyer to disclose confidential information in defense of him or herself. So the question in those cases, or at least in one of those cases, was to some extent... What does that mean? What does defense mean? Does it, does it have to mean someone's filed an actual complaint about me in court? We know that's not true because lawyers can do it to defend themselves in disciplinary cases before they're ever in court, when they're in investigations. So um, the, the lawyers argued, I was defending myself from these negative reviews or from this negative Better Business Bureau complaint. And the rule, I think, doesn't really address that one way or the other. These cases were not the kind of close cases where the court was going to have to address that, right? Because they were so far beyond the bounds of what would be acceptable. But I think a response that was less damaging to the client would have made a better case for us to talk about right now in terms of how the Supreme Court handled it. Because I think they, at some point, the court might have to face questions like, what does defense mean? What, what does that look like? Is it defense against a bad review? Is it defense against you know, online defamation? What, is that, what does that really look like? And how far can you go in responding to a client complaint? There was significant discussion in the office when we I, those were my cases that I prosecuted in the Office of Attorney Regulation Counsel. There was significant discussion about um, the idea that a lot of lawyers rely on online resources to generate business, such that a negative Google Plus review that pops up at the top of the Google list when you Google, you know, Katie Roth, Gary, criminal defense lawyer, is hugely harmful. And, and so... In fact, one of the lawyers in those cases said, I only submitted that response because my SEO consultant, my search engine optimization consultant, told me not to let it go unresponded to because it's better for my search results if I have a response up there. So um, I think that these are unsettled questions. Certainly we can all agree that you know, you can't be disparaging your client publicly, and that's very a very bad idea. But um, 
I think there is a, a huge segment of the lawyer population that needs online reviews, needs positive reviews, or needs to respond to negative reviews in order to keep their practice afloat. And so what are those lawyers supposed to do, I think, is still you know something that's not totally clear. Yeah. Don't you think the lawyer is just making it worse by being so despair? I mean, like when you see on TripAdvisor yes. or something and the hotel responds, they're not like, you suck and, you oh, know, right. a terrible thing. Right. right. Because I think that just, you know, you look at that and you're like, oh my God. So I think they would right. always, you're not defending yourself, you're making it even worse. No, you're making it even worse. Because what you, you know, I think the kind of response that that would be okay is something like, we at the Roth Gary Law Firm, work hard for every client and we don't always get the results that the clients most want but we always do our best for our clients and we hope that we can resolve all the, our clients cases favorably that's right good. where you don't say anything about that particular matter and you're sort of very professional and taking the high road but you do get to submit a response i don't think there's really any issue under the rules of professional conduct with that kind of response and i think it's probably better in terms of anyone who's going to come and read that um, because who wants to hire the lawyer who just told you everything about the last case they handled right. like that's a bad sign but so you're conflating two things you're talking about we're talking about it from the ethics point of view, and you're talking about it from the business point of view, mm -hmm. and how do they mesh? And the answer is, I read these opinions basically, is, well, you can defend yourself any way you want, you just can't reveal a confidence doing it, which hobbles any lawyer in trying to respond to any of these online reviews, other than a very general comment that I do my best. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything else you can say. Unless you try to go to Google and say, how about making this number 50 instead of number one, or something like that, and have no idea how you can do it because I'm sure you can't tell Google anything about how they're going about how they're going to rank you right. one way or the other. Right. There are a lot of things in social media and all and all these different areas we've been talking about. But if you're using these technologies, and by the way, you may not use them, you have to talk about competence, advertising. We really haven't touched on that much. There's an ethics opinion we, we cited, I believe it's in your materials, it just came out from California a little while ago. It's about when, what happens when an attorney blogs, when does a blog turn into an advertisement? Because when it's an advertisement, then other considerations come into place, as opposed for something that's just informational. So there are issues about that. There's also issues, obviously, about truthfulness of advertisements. Lawyers get hooked into that a lot. Furnishing legal advice through social media is an area we haven't seen much ethics opinions on, but the problem is if you, and remember I asked you before if you have a web page, is it interactive? If you have a web page or you're going to social media sites, someone asks a question and you respond to it, you may be creating a prospective attorney client relationship or an attorney client relationship by doing that. So that, I haven't seen much on that. I mean, there's some ethics opinions about it. We know you can't do it, but obviously the second you create the attorney-client relationship, you've got any one of a number of issues to going to crop up on that. In including conflicts issues. Including conflicts mm -hmm. issues. Now, uh, the D.C. ethics opinion, what you were talking about, it's ethics opinion 370 and 371. There are two of them issued the same day from the D.C. bar. One of the issues goes back talking about blogging and suggests that if you blog about a particular topic, you may be creating a positional conflict. So if you say something on a blog and that's inconsistent with a stance you're taking in a current litigation or the like, you could be disqualifying yourself. Uh, that's a lot of talk about that. Positional conflicts generally come up in very, very restricted circumstances, but it's enough that it's in there and it's something. And the, one more thing for you to think about as you're doing things. Evidence we talked about already, that's when you're trying to contact someone and how you get stuff. Communicating with clients, that's going back to confidentiality that we talked about earlier, how to maintain confidences. Researching jurors and reporting juror misconduct. There's obviously a big difference between the two. So you're researching members of a veneer and the jury's been sitting and if they've got a public page and you see they're talking about a case, you have an, ob you have an ethical obligation, I believe, to report that to the court. And there's something else going on there. That's another thing. And then one more, uh, communications with judges. Uh, does this state elect judges? 
We have retention elections. It's, it's merit yep. selection. Okay, we have retention elections. So elections. these judges are running for office at some but, but, point, but right? no campaigning. No campaigns. Really? Did they put a social media page up? That no, they says can't they're running? do that. They're no. prohibited from doing that? Okay, well, leave aside the First Amendment violation <laughs> in that because there's so a lot of case law and jurisdiction where judges are elected talking about First Amendment rights to go and communicate, but then the problem is when they're communicating exactly what's being said. And this goes for you as lawyers where they're advertising. Are, th are, they, are there any misrepresentations in it? Are there any facts there that can be subject to verification and the like? Florida is probably the jurisdiction that has that much case law that's developed in the area, in the area of elections. But from what you're telling me, they can't do anything here. So other than the First Amendment issue, uh, it probably Shapiro, isn't I, I, I do want to follow up on an interesting point that you made about monitoring jurors' Facebook pages during a trial, oh. whether you have an obligation to do that. So let's say that a juror makes a statement that's, that establishes the juror has made up his or her mind early in the case before he or she has heard all the evidence. Um, that may be grounds for reversal, of course. What if you haven't monitored that page, later find out about that prejudicial statement, uh, your client loses, gets an adverse verdict, you could have brought that to the attention of the judge. You didn't because you didn't monitor the page. You've lost the right to raise that issue to set aside the verdict. Have you committed malpractice? Have you committed professional negligence by not finding that Facebook posting by that uh, juror who has violated his or her oath? Well, there is a decision out of the Missouri Supreme Court mm -hmm that held that an attorney had engaged in effective assistance to counsel because he never made inquiries over at social media accounts of jurors. Uh, there's a decision today where there was ineffective, not today, I talked about it this morning, ineffective assistance to counsel because an attorney did not challenge the admissibility of certain information, electronic information. So there are a lot of issues with that. I mean, did the attorney know about it pre-verdict? because there are rules about impeaching jurors about what goes on in jury rooms, but if it's a public posting, then it's an extraneous influence. Maybe another rule going there. Now, we've seen the U.S. Supreme Court just decided a case a couple weeks ago about impeaching jurors post-verdict. It's and, a Colorado case. Right, it's Colorado, and they carved out an exception based on racial bias that was demonstrated in the jury room. There's a lot going on here we don't know in these areas just because the cases haven't percolated up to the appellate level yet. But sooner or later they will because every, if anyone under 30 has a social media page, I can't imagine they don't. Some of you are near 30 or under 30. I expect you may have social media presences. I avoid it as much as I possibly can because I don't want to deal with all these issues going on one way or the other. Uh, it's a generational gap I expect we're seeing. And that's another issue to deal with, other than not being ageist or whatever we are. Ageist? Right, right, right. Okay, that's we don't right. want to be ageist. We don't want to be ageist. And my younger, tells, uh, my younger daughter tells me no one uses Facebook anymore. It's all... My son's leader is a count. Yeah. 17. Yeah. And it started when he was, I think, 13 or 12, and he's like, oh, all stupid stuff on there. And he doesn't. Yeah. So he uses, so what, what Snapchat? Snapchat. 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 Instagram. 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 Yes. Instagram. They Instagram. message on Twitter, yeah. like private yeah. messages. Yeah, yeah. Instagram is very hot right now. <laughs> there's no record, but there is a record, right? On Instagram, there's a record. I think s Snapchat, Snapchat got in the, trouble with the FTC. Well, the thing about Snapchat, Snapchat is, is the image is supposed to disappear unless you do a swipe on your phone, and you can save it. And that's what happened with this community, I believe it was in Virginia, where um, these junior high school or young high school uh, young women were providing provocative photos to the boys, and the boys were saying, oh, don't worry, this is Snapchat, the pictures will disappear, while well, the boys were swiping, saving the images, and then circulating them, and then the prosecutors had to decide whether to prosecute these folks for sex abuse crimes. And there were a lot of young people involved. I think there was a story in the New York Times Magazine about that a while back. Now, one of the issues also that you're bringing up, a lot of time, well, not a lot of times, there are instances where some of these services may make representations about what they do or they don't do. There is a big FTC settlement. I think it was with Snapchat. I'm not 100% sure where Snapchat says we don't use them for anything, we don't keep them, and it turns out they're selling bits of information. There's a lot of money in information 
that's communicated electronically. Uh, that was a settlement late last year, I believe. So there's a lot of different things going on, and it goes back to something before when you're using all these social media platforms. Let's go back to confidence and com confidentiality. Do you all read the terms of service when you're deciding to use these things? I kind of bet your 17-year-old son does not. Is that kind of fair to think? Yeah. So you may be giving a lot of things away, a lot of protections away you might think you have. And for our point of view as lawyers, knowledge of all these different I mean, you can't know every term of service for every social media outlet. It's impossible. But if you're doing investigations, for example, you're looking at prospective jurors in a veneer, you need to know how you're doing the investigation because depending on what your jurisdiction says, you may be engaging in an ex parte contact. So there's, it's hard to figure out how to do all this. Now, it's more, this is more scary than anything else, quite frankly. And Lino, you were talking before about the Illinois ethics opinion. Yes. Some of those things just can't happen. I mean, a, a social media provider cannot assure you that the government will never require information from you and issue you with a no contact order. So you can't tell the subscriber that they're being investigated and you produced information for it. So there's a lot of different nuances to things here to learn. And I'll go back to where we started. The best thing for you to do when you're dealing with anything now is to know what questions to ask. That's probably the best advice we could all give you today. Because I, I wish I could tell you there's uniformity across the country on everything. If you practice exclusively in Colorado, great, you're in good shape. But if you're a firm that has offices in different cities or if you practice in more than one jurisdiction, maybe someone's admitted to Wyoming or the like, Wyoming rules may be different in this regard than anything else. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments? Anyone going to go delete their Facebook account? <laughs> or at least turn up the security settings. <laughs> well, how many of you know all the, different, all the different security settings you have on your social media platforms? You know them? Sure. Okay. Same thing that says Max. Huh? I'm no, sorry. I haven't seen anything on Facebook that says Max settings. It just says friends only, public. And it doesn't say Max, but... Is that friends only? Just like making it as private as possible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I used a service that looked at my Facebook and told me, oh, you should delete that. Like, you know, don't say where you went to high school. Don't say where you went to college. You know, delete all this information. Well, that's going beyond what we're talking about in the sense is there's such a giant emphasis on privacy now and avoiding giving any personal identifiers out anywhere. Because the more you give out, the more possible it is that someone can go and hack you because they've got all this personal information that's there. But that still goes back to your obligations as an attorney because you have to talk to your client about all this information they have, and you have to be able to understand what they can and can't do, or you get into trouble like this lawyer in Virginia did. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He didn't mean, he didn't mean to say destroy it. He meant to say protect it yeah. or whatever. You give wrong advice, that's called malpractice, assuming someone had a problem with that as opposed to intentional conduct. And that takes us to a whole different ballpark on different things. Right. Also, to circle back to the duty to supervise, you've all been here, you heard what we have to say, but you may have law clerks, you may have summer associates this summer, uh, you may have paralegals who haven't heard the, haven't received the message. Well, you've got to communicate it to them. So you've got to make sure that, for example, a summer associate who may be a 1L or 2L doesn't post on Facebook, wow, I'm working on this great case for XYZ client. Uh, yes, we always for years have had the lecture on confidentiality, but now that needs to include social media as well. And what you post on it and how much access you give people to right. it and all those other things. Right. Uh, we have 15 minutes, no questions, nothing came in online. Any comments or whatever, and then we're going to, if we break a little early, we're going to break a little early. So, Lino, any thoughts, closing thoughts and the like? Nothing specific unless people have questions. Okay. Katie, anything? Yeah, it's same for me, unless anyone has a question. I'd recommend you look at two things again in addition to the materials we've given you and the links you've got, <coughs> the New York Social Media Ethics Guidelines. Basically go through all the things we've been talking about today. You can just Google it. As I said, there'll be a new edition out 
in July probably. I also, I also mentioned the Florida Bar Guide to Effective communi Legal Communications. Uh, very general, but it's still a nice resource as to what you might do and how you might communicate with people one way or the other. And generally speaking, this is particular for litigation, the Sedona Jumpstart Outline is available on the Sedona website under publications. You can just download it. You can get any Sedona publication if you want without joining Sedona. Sedona is a think tank. Uh, Sedona has a lot of judicial members, plaintiffs, defendants, government folks, and they do a lot of work in the world of electronic information. It's $295 to be a member. That means you get to see drafts that are not public. If you want to just look at public documents, all you need to do is go to the publications tab, hit on what you want. You have to give contact information. And other than that, you get access to anything public. That would be public comment versions. So when Sedona drafts a document, they'll send it out to the public to look at for comment. And then their final versions that come out. There have been a lot have been coming out in the last year or so that are relevant to the things we've been talking about. They have a guide for they have privacy guides. A lot of issues pertaining to attorney competence about best practices and search and the like proportionality, which is not what we talked about today. They all have something you may want to look at. It's called the Sedona Glossary. It's in its fourth edition. And there are a lot of definitions in there, including things we've been talking about today, that might be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. And unless anyone has any questions or comments, I think thank you all. Enjoy the weekend. It's not the weekend yet, oh. but for me it is. <laughs> so enjoy the weekend, and maybe we'll see you back at the e-discovery program in the summer. June, June 21st. June 21st. All right, so thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you for being here.